And so that's the big news on this. If you look at uh, what we're doing, uh, on the 700, the current takeoff weight on the 700 is 154,000 pounds. On the max, it's going to be 159,000 pounds. A 5,000 pound change in takeoff weight on the airplane. And the airplane will fly 400 miles farther than today's airplanes. This is the first time we are showing this to the world. So this is news for you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a circle chart to notionally chart that. And a circle chart. I always talk about circle charts. And the first thing somebody asks me is, why aren't they round? Well, you, you, you do know that the wind effects are in these circle charts. Huh? And so this is a notional. Uh, idea of what you could actually capture for incremental cities with 400 more miles of range. Uh, the real reason for these range changes are not necessarily what you see on there. We want robust transcontinental range in the U.S., robust range in Europe, and if you look at the 800, here is a change that goes from 174,000 pound airplane to 181,000 pound airplane, 7,000 7, pounds of takeoff weight, 540 more miles of range with the airplane. Really robust transcon U.S. airplane with this. Fly everyone, everywhere you want to fly in the U.S. and in Europe and in China with the airplane. Uh, if you then look at the Dash 9, again from 187,000 pound airplane to 194,000 pound airplane, 7,000 more pounds of range, 540 more miles. Now this is the airplane that's going to be the 757 replacement. It's got the seats and everybody says range on the 757 because you know that 757 is big wing airplane, lots of engine thrust on it, flies long range. In fact, 757s fly across the Atlantic right now. This is not going to replace those airplanes. There's about 50 of those flying across the Atlantic. And those 50 airplanes are the last off the line 757s that the Boeing company ever produced. And they'll be in service for a long, long time. The rest of the 1,000 airplanes that fly around in the world all fly ranges that are less than the maximum range of the 7379. And this airplane is probably going to be on the order of 30% better trip cost. 30% better trip cost than the 757. And seat mile cost, that's going to be substantially better as well. So this is the 757 replacement with this range equipment. And if you look at the ranges of the airplanes, the 7, the 8, and the 9, when compared to our competitors, we have always, always had the longer range of the two airplanes. So you can see there's our advantage over the 7, over the 8, and over the 9. And when you uh, talk about this in kilometers, it's a huge number, 900 kilometers on the Dash 9. And that's why this is going to be a 757 replacement. Now, I am going to talk to you about a comparison between what these guys are doing over here and what we are doing with our airplane. And the first thing I always get a uh, conversation about, and I go to many conferences, by the way, and you know I have some ISTAD uh, association as well, so I sit in thousand-man conferences, and we get people up on stage and they talk, start talking about fan diameter. And they keep telling everyone that the bigger the fan diameter, the better the fuel burn on the airplane. And then they say that's just physics. Well, physics work a little differently in Seattle than they work in Toulouse. The fact is, is that that's not just physics. Because the fact is, when you put bigger fans on airplanes, you also put more weight on airplanes. And when you put more weight on airplanes, you affect fuel burn. And not only that, if you have bigger fans. Now, by the way, we have the biggest fan in the world, right? We have GE 90 115Bs. They're 128 inch <coughs> diameter fans. If big fans were what we needed on airplanes, we'd have two of them on here. Now, just think of how much that would weigh. Weight and drag, because when you get big fans, you get big nacelles, you get a lot of wetted area, you get a lot more drag. So it's not just fans. 
Airplanes are bodies and wings and engines. They're weight and L over D and TSFC. And so when you look at all of that, here is a comparison of an A320 to a 737-800. Now, I've seen this chart pr uh, produced by the other guys, and this thing is right up here at parity with the A320. Why is that? Why that is, is because they decide that there's 150 seats in this airplane, and in this airplane there's only five more. This airplane is 88 inches longer, 88 inches longer than an A320. Now, if you know that most seats are at 30-inch pitch, you divide 30 into 88, how many seat rows do you get? You don't get five seats. You get at least 12, and then sometimes you get as many as 18. And if I can convince you that there's only five seats different between these two airplanes, I could convince you of anything. So, you go talk to airlines. There are several airlines who fly both of these airplanes. And you ask them what the fuel burn difference is in the two airplanes. And they will tell you, and make sure you ask them in fuel burn per seat, not in fuel burn per airplane, because in fuel burn per airplane, they are about equal. But this airplane has 12 more seats. So in fuel burn per seat, these airplanes are about 7% difference. And oh, notice that this is a 61-inch fan, and that's a 68-inch fan. Remember my conversation about bigger fans, and that's just physics? Why doesn't that work there? Because there's weight and drag involved. Now, what happens is that when you put a bigger engine on this airplane, about 10 inches bigger, on a test stand, on a test stand, that gets to about 14% better fuel burn. But remember these guys, drag and weight, you pay a penalty for that. You pay a rather large penalty of that for that of about 4% in fuel burn. The other thing they're going to do is remove these tip fences. And when you remove those tip fences, they are an improvement. You're removing an improvement, you pay a penalty for that. You pay about a 1% penalty for that. But now they've got religion on winglets. Winglets add about 3% improved over that airplane, 12% of, I've got my algebra right, should get us down to about minus 5. And sure enough, there we are at minus 5 with a 10-inch bigger fan. Now we're going to do something similar, right? We're going to put a bigger fan on the airplane. We're going to put about an 8-inch bigger fan on the airplane, and that fan is going to get us about a 14% improved airplane in fuel burn on a test stand. But we are going to pay a weight and drag penalty for that as well. But remember, this fan is going to be a lot smaller than that one. And it's the square cube law, right? This is, you know, when you put 10 inches more radius in an airplane, you know, 5 inches more radius, 10 inches more diameter, you get a lot bigger engine. And when you get a lot bigger square, you also get a lot bigger volume. Now. 14% improved, 3%, and then remember we had this conversation about the aft body, 1% improved for the aft body. And in the winglet, I showed you 1.5%, that's at longer ranges, this is at 500 miles, so it's about 1% at 500 miles because you spend less time in cruise. Add all those up, 1, one is 2, 14 is 16, minus 3, 13% improved. So we should be down here at about 13. So what has happened in the last year, this whole conversation about re-engineering and whether we ought to do new airplanes and NEOs or Maxis or whatever, what has happened is that originally the two airplanes, 737-800 to 8320, were about 7% different. Now after all this time, energy and money spent by the OEMs, what we have is an airplane that is 13 compared to 5 or 8% different. So essentially what has happened is that we are at parity in
competition or maybe slightly better with our airplane. But remember, when you look at these charts, remember 150 seats and 162 seats, because if you see a different number, you better raise your hand and ask a question. Now, all of that translates into, as we said, 8% lower seat mile cost. But the other interesting thing is if you compare this even on a trip basis, this is a really compelling result. Here's a bigger airplane carrying 12 more passengers and still doing it at 1% less trip cost. 